Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to start our before last lecture, which will be on the foundations of welfare economics. The subject of welfare economics is, uh, the main problem is to give a scientific foundation for public policy. Uh, and uh, to make a long story again short is uh, the main problem that we encounter here, uh, it's a very fundamental problem, is to define a criterion that p would permit us to distinguish between better and worse policies. Is there such a thing that um, uh, a criterion that would allow us to make such a distinction or is such a distinction invariably bound up with value judgments? Uh, economic science uh, is a value-free science. That is, uh, the, the truth and falsity of uh, economic propositions can be uh, evaluated according well, to the truth criterion alone. Uh, they do not make any uh, uh, statements about which policy should be, should be pursued. So we have here the, the concept of value of freedom, which was uh, stressed in particular by a German sociologist of the, the name of Max Weber. He was not the first one to make this observation, but there was a big debate in the German so, uh, Economist Association in the <coughs> early 20th century. Uh, most economists of the time belonging to the so-called historical school of economics held that economics was invariably bound up with value judgments. So you could not, there was no such science uh, that was not somehow premised on value judgments, what uh, scientists believed to be good or bad. And Weber held that that was then not a science at all. So it might very well be that economics was premised on value judgments, but then economics wasn't a science at all. Uh, rather, science, in a strict sense, is about is propositions rather than all propositions. So we have here another name, namely David Hume, British philosopher of the 18th century, who stressed the distinction between is and odd is and odd propositions. So Hume said in particular that there's no way that we can arrive at an odd proposition um, by starting from premises that are is propositions. Right? So for example, we can say, well, uh, this room has a surface of uh, 150 square meters, uh, and there are 130 lamps. Therefore, the government should regulate the number of attendees to this conference. Okay, so that sounds uh, ridiculous at first glance. And what Hume said, well, wh whenever you have such, uh, such a thing, it is always uh, the case that the odds uh, statement cannot be logically derived from the is It's a different, distinct logical character. So the question then is, uh, how is it in economic science? To give you just one uh, example, how economic propositions that show that economic propositions are is propositions that can be used in various ways according to different value judgments. Let's consider the labor market. So we have here supply of labor and we have a demand of labor and we know that so you have quantity, uh, labor hours and we have here the wage rate, nominal wage rate, a big W and in equilibrium, we have an equilibrium wage rate and an equilibrium quantity. And uh, so now we can do various things. And in particular, we can imagine or analyze the impact of a minimum wage law. So let's say the minimum wage law fixes the minimum wage rate at this level here. Uh, what will be the impact on the labor market? Well, there will be none. Okay. Because uh, the market wage rate, the wage rate that comes to be established spontaneously on the market is, um, oh sorry, if we fix the minimum wage rate here, so it will be none, right? The market wage rate is higher than the minimum wage rate, so there's no problem at all. A problem arises if we set the minimum wage rate here, because at this um, uh, rate, we have this demand for labor, but this supply, okay? So we have a difference between demand and supply, and this difference is, call, is called, how is it called? Unemployment. Unemployment, that's right. Okay, so we have a higher uh, supply of labor than uh, demand for labor, 
And this is exactly what unemployment is all about. Now, um, this is a purely uh, fact-based analysis. There's no value judgment here, whatever. We don't say unemployment is good or bad, or it is good or bad that there is such a thing as a demand for labor, or is it good or bad that there's a supply of labor. Well, as we know that some um, uh, socialists, and I mentioned this yesterday, right, they think that it's, it's bad, that there should be a market for labor right, because it's, it's denigrating and demeaning uh, for human beings to sell labor hours and so on. But we're not concerned about this. It's a, it's a fact that there is such a, such a thing as an exchange uh, taking place. So we're not concerned about the moral evaluation of this. We're just saying it's a fact that this, these exchanges do take place. And if the condition, conditions are such that the minimum wage rate is set above the market rate, then we do have unemployment. Okay. Now, in fact, this uh, purely factual information can be used according uh, to different value judgments. For example, uh, uh, the natural uh, reaction, I think that's, that's the, according to my value judgment, that's the, uh, the normal, the non-pathological reaction faced to this information is to say, well, minimum wage laws are bad. Right? Because either they don't have any impact at all, if they are lower than, than the market wage rate, or if they are higher than the market wage rate, well, they, they bring about unemployment. So they bring about misery for some people. Right? And so my value judgment would be, well, then, therefore, then we should not have minimum wage rules. Okay. Now, but that does not follow at all. So my art here does not follow at all from the is analysis. You can very well arrive at a very different conclusion. For example, you might say, well, I want to have minimum wage laws precisely because it brings about unemployment. And that seems to be absurd, but in fact it is not that absurd because there are uh, historical cases where we can um, uh, identify uh, political proposals that boil down exactly to such a uh, position. Uh, the matter becomes clearer if we think about, well, who will be actually fired? Who will become unemployed if we have minimum wage laws? Well, it will be those people whose, uh, the marginal productivity of whose labor is inferior to the minimum wage laws, right? So if we have, let's see, the minimum wage, or the, the, the market wage rate would be something like, whatever, eight, eight uh, euros or seven euros, and then market would be uh, 10 or 11. And then we set the uh, minimum wage law slightly higher, let's say 12 or so, or 13. Well, it's clear that it wouldn't be Bill Gates who will become unemployed, okay? Will not be most professors and so on. But it will be people whose uh, value, pro the value productivity of whose labor is low. So who is this typically? Well, unexperienced people, uh, such as children, handicapped people, uh, immigrants, right? whose uh, access uh, to the labor market is reduced by the fact that they don't master the language and similar things. Uh, uh, females looking for part-time jobs and so on. Now, based on this information, that it will be some mi rather minorities or low performance groups that will be affected most, uh, it might be that you have politicians who seek precisely this outcome. For example, in the early 20th century, uh, the California labor unions have pressed for minimum wage laws yeah. precisely because they knew that the Chinese immigrants, so their main competitors on the market, would be affected most. During the 19th century, most Euro uh, labor unions uh, in Europe have pressed for minimum wage laws because they knew that the, uh, these laws would affect child labor most, okay, and female labor. Uh, today, uh, we might say uh, uh, in the U.S. there are some bad mouths who say, well, the, uh, certain democratic politicians advocate minimum wage laws because they know precisely that these laws will create misery among their main constituencies. So they want to create miscontents and unhappy people because only then they create conditions of social unrest that would uh, create greater uh, left-wing radicalization among their constituency. So this, of course, all this seems to be rather perverse, and I think it is perverse, according to my value judgments. But we, what we see here, and that is my point, is that you can arrive at very different art statements uh, 
based on the very same information is information that economic science provides you with. Okay, so economics is value free, it's purely fact based information, and then you can make very different uses with it. Now the question is, and that's again as I've said, the, the question of welfare economics is can we go beyond this? Is it really, are we limited in our statements to these fact based uh, is statements or is there something that we can say beyond this? And here I will uh, discuss today four uh, approaches. The first one is one of the classical economists. Then I'll talk about the modern, modern economics uh, in general, then in particular about the Pareto uh, criterion. And then finally I'll uh, discuss Professor Hoppe's approach. Okay, so the classical economists, so how did they uh, uh, address this question? Uh, the classical, there is one particularity about the classical economists, in particular Adam Smith's uh, theory has been further developed by Say and Ricardo, uh, uh, that despite all criticisms that might be addressed against the British classical school, uh, still is important. Namely, Adam Smith has so far developed the only tenable growth theory. Okay. Uh, when the marginalist revolution arrived, about which we have talked much yesterday, uh, there was a shift in emphasis in what eco uh, the problems that economists were dealing with from uh, the classical economists who mainly dealt with questions of growth okay, to the new problems that had to do with price theory and equilibrium and so on. Okay. So and as a consequence we have new uh, neoclassical growth <coughs> theories that are not growth theories at all. So if, if you Sometimes you, you read articles or there's a whole branch of e economics that is growth theory today. Growth theory today has nothing to do with what economists were doing in the, in the 19th century. Okay? Modern growth theory, the main problem of modern growth theory is to specify the conditions under which you can have equilibrium or general equilibrium in, uh, in, a, in a growing economy. It does not specify the conditions under which you, have, which you do have growth. And that was the great subject of the classical economists. What the classical economists explained was that you, there were only two ways of increasing uh, growth. Uh, one was the division of labor, and the other one was capital accumulation. Okay? Because only by capital accumulation can you increase uh, the quantity of, of capital goods that is ultimately tools uh, that make human labor more physically productive. Okay, I won't go into detail, but it has to do with what economists call the laws of return. Uh, we have here the quantity of a factor of production, and here we have um, uh, the physical return, the product, physically defined. We always have something like this, a curve like this. Right? And the only way to change this, this limitation that we see here, this maximum, is to add tools. If we add a tool, we get something like this. Right? That's the curve, that's the physical uh, product of a fisherman fishing with his bare hand. Okay? This is the curve of a fisherman fishing with a net or with an angle. Okay? So it's only by adding up tools that we make our labor more physically productive, but we, in order to have tools, in order to produce tools, we need to have capital, we need to save. Okay, so that's the story. Now, the classical economists from this observation jumped somewhat naively to the uh, conclusion that capital accumulation is always good. The more capital, the better. Okay? That's a conviction that you find pervas per pervasively in all the writings of the classical economists. And it has led to certain excesses at the end of the 19th century and the, in the early 20th century when people of the sort uh, of uh, John Maynard Keynes, but also others, started thinking about ways of how he could, through political intervention, artificially increase capital accumulation, right? and in particular through manipulating the money supply. But even if we abstract from these excesses, uh, there is the fact that uh, we cannot say from the, from the if statement that uh, the only way to, to increase, to make uh, human labor more physical uh, productive is to increase the capital supply, that we ought to increase uh, the capital supply, right? that we ought to save more and so on. That by no, uh, 
no means follows. Right? At all points of time, we have to, choo uh, to choose between um, greater physical productivity of, of our labor in the future, that is greater uh, availability, greater wealth in the future, and greater wealth now. Right? In order to have uh, uh, greater uh, wealth in the future, we need to save now, that is, we need to cut down on our present day consumption. Okay, there's no other way, so there's a trade-off. But there's nothing in, in economic science tells you that you've got to save more, right? You can as well decide, well, I mean, I'll continue my hand-in-mouth existence, I just consume everything that I produce, and so I'll stay on a fairly low level of economic development. Yes, why not? And in a market economy, in a free society, this problem is solved, or this question is answered through the uh, interaction of many, many individuals. Right? The overall result is then uh, the combined outcome of each individual's decision. So everybody has uh, some impact on the overall outcome. And that's how it, all this question is answered. But uh, economic science cannot give an answer what the optimal growth rate would be, so what the optimal savings rate would be, and so on. So we have here uh, a limitation. The second approach is the approach of the uh, modern economics. Now, as I've said, in modern economics, there was, with the marginalist revolution, a shift in emphasis from problems of growth and capital to uh, problems of uh, the analysis of market pricing, right? value theory, price theory, the theory of general equilibrium. Unfortunately, we have to drop our general equilibrium lecture today, so I'll just elegantly stop, step beyond this. Right? And uh, as I've explained to you yesterday, with the modern marginalist revolution, the explanation of market prices was shifted from cost of production to, uh, to utility or value. Right? Before, so to say, the, the prices were explained from the side of, uh, of the factors of production. Now all prices were explained from the side of consumer utility and so on. So it was only natural to try to explain or try to, to justify public policy in terms of utility. And the problem here, the main problem that we confront here is already, as I, as I said yesterday, that utility and the famous util are abstractions. Right? Even for one individual, we cannot define such a unit okay, uh, that would somehow sum up in a realistic manner all the different enjoyments that he derives from various consumer goods. But it's even more difficult if we um, uh, make such a, a statement for society as a whole. Right? Some economists, of course, heroic as they are, have posited the existence of such a thing as a social utility function. And so we have here uh, aggregate products, so this is uh, GDP, and here we have the big social U, right? And then uh, decreasing marginal utility, right, for society as a whole. Now, as I said, that is heroic, right? Because you just, it's an, you make such an assertion in utter disregard for. Uh, for reality, there's no such thing. Already this here is an abstraction, right? It's, it's a fiction. It presuppose that we have some common denominator for physically very heterogeneous goods. And then you posit the existence of a social utility, even though we cannot even define what so, uh, utility is for one individual. Now, even before the social utility function theory has been developed by the mid of the 20th century, uh, several economists have become aware of the essential problem of any such approach that tries to solve or cut, uh, uh, solve the, the question of uh, political decision making from an aggregate point of view. And this is the problem of interpersonal comparisons of utility. And the man who has pioneered uh, the analysis of this problem was a Czech 
Austrian economist by the name of Franz Schuell. In a book that he published in 1907 with the title Zur Lehre von den Bedürfnissen, On the Theory of Needs. Okay? And here Schuell uh, pointed out that we can talk meaningfully of utility only in the context of choice. Right? So as a predecessor of Mises, Mises was strongly influenced by him. And he also pointed out that we cannot com therefore compare, it's even impossible to compare uh, the decisions and therefore the utilities that uh, for one individual at different points of time, because we, there are different choices involved, and it is all the more impossible to compare the utilities for different individuals because there are also different choices involved. All right, so we cannot do this. Now that is significant because this book uh, was known to all uh, the young Austrian economists that were members of the Mbarberg seminar and therefore it was also known to Ludwig von Mises. And not surprisingly, therefore, it was not Mises who was part of those who developed the social utility function theory. Right? So he always refused this. Uh, many years before um, the critique of inter interpersonal comparisons of utility uh, was, uh, uh, came to the conscious, consciousness of Anglo-Saxon economists, and it came to the consciousness of Anglo-Saxon economists through Lionel Robbins in a book that Professor Hoppe already mentioned, right, the 1932 book, um, The Nature and Significance of Economic Science. And there, Robbins discussed this problem, said it's, it's a big problem for aggregate uh, social analysis. Now, uh, Mises then is known as, uh, as a famous theoretician of the market economy, as a great opponent of government interventionism. How can he oppose government interventionism um, if he sticks to economic science? That is, if he sticks to the is, how can he arrive at the odd statement, well, that this policy is wrong from a scientific point of view, that it's unjustifiable from a scientific point of view? And it is significant that Mises, in full consciousness of Truhell's work, worked around this problem and found a way of um, discussing uh, public policy in purely, uh, purely in is terms, that purely as a factual problem. And what Mises uh, pointed out is the following. Mises said that economists cannot tell us what we ought to do, but since e economics is about the analysis of causal relations, and it's also between cause and effect, so also the uh, cause, uh, causal relations between means and ends, we are in a position as economists to uh, analyze whether a given means is fit to attain a given end, that is, a predefined end. And this allows us, as economists, to make factual statements within a given context of a public policy debate if we take the point of view of those who advocate a given policy. For example, come back on this uh, minimum wage law business right, with the labor market and then the minimum wage law. What Mises says is, if somebody advocates minimum wage laws as saying, well, they will have no impact on employment, we can say, well, that is factually wrong. Right? So it's a wrong policy. The policy, to the extent that the policy is uh, designed to increase employment, it's a wrong policy. We, as economists, we can say it's, it just doesn't work. Right? So we, have to, we can reject this policy, and we don't do it in the light of our own value judgments. Rather, we take the, the standpoint of the person who advocates the policy. Okay. And since we are only dealing with means and ends, or only with the relations between facts, and we take the point of view of those who, who say that there is a certain relation here, and we show that it's wrong. And Mises took various other, uh, uh, analyzed various other examples. And his, his most famous example was um, uh, the milk market, right? a big problem after World War I in Austria when there was misery, especially poor families and so hardly could feed their, their children. And then there were uh, uh, public measures designed, for example, price control on, on milk. 
the official justification for which was, well, we need to make milk more uh, available for poor families. Now, a price control on milk has very much uh, the same effect here. The price control here, so we set the price below the equilibrium price, so this would be the milk market, right? And the, the market price would be here, and so there are people who are complaining that all oh, the poor families and mothers cannot feed their children, right? Milk is too expensive. And now Mises says, look, I mean, if we set the milk price here officially, what we get is this. The supply will lag behind the demand. Why is this? Because uh, at the lower price, milk production, there will be marginal milk producers, those uh, who could produce milk profitably only at the slightly higher price. Right? If we decrease the price, uh, these people will go out of business, will not produce anymore. As a consequence, the milk supply will actually be reduced. Right? It would no longer be this quantity that otherwise would have been on the market. It would now be this quantity. And at which price will this new quantity be sold on the market? Well, it would be sold at this price here. That would be the, the black market price for milk. Okay, so we increase the problems rather than uh, diminish them through this uh, proposed policy. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the only approach. The importance of Mises' approach is that it is the only approach uh, that we have at our disposition in economics, uh, as far as economics is concerned, to discuss public policy and to, to say, well, this is a good or a bad policy. That's the only way, that's as far as we can go. Okay. There's another approach to which we come now that is uh, much more famous uh, than Mises' approach and is known under the name of Pareto Criterion Approach. So, Wilfredo Pareto, famous Italian mathematical economist, who argued, as his, uh, his master and thought, uh, Leon Valras, that in general equilibrium, uh, the social aggregates of society reaches an optimum. Okay, so if you reach general uh, equilibrium, this is the optimum point for society. Why is this so? Because in general equilibrium, no more arbitrage processes are possible. Right? What is arbitrage? Arbitrage is, take an easy example, if I um, uh, buy at a, in, a, in a part of the market where the price is low and sell in a part of the market where the price is still high. I reap a profit and nobody else is worse off. Right? The guy from whom I buy at the uh, at the lower price, he's better off than the guy to whom I sell at, at the higher price, you know, decreasing the price slightly, he's better off as well. So it's a Pareto superior move, that's how it is called, right? until finally we reach general equilibrium in which it is impossible for any market participant to increase his position, to uh, improve his position, right? without at the same time deteriorating the pos uh, position of somebody else. Okay? So that was... Pareto's argument. And uh, as, ever, uh, as it is ever the case uh, in the works of the mathematical economists, as soon as they set out to, to derive odd propositions or make statements about optima and so on, they fall prey to the problem of interpersonal comparisons of utility because we have exactly this problem here. It is not the case as uh, Pareto uh, held that we could uh, somehow avoid this problem uh, by, by stressing general equilibrium. For what is taking place here? Is it really the case that nobody is, uh, is worth, uh, worse off? Let's again consider the, the, the case of the trader who buys in a market where the price is low and uh, sells in a market where the price is high. What is he doing? Well, he's taking business away from some people who would have bought at a lower price in the market where the, the price was low. Right? And now he's selling in the other market where the price is high at a slightly lower price. So again, he's taking business away from other people who would otherwise have sold there. 
Okay. Now, uh, th that's one problem. The other problem is the uh, so-called problem of the envy person, of the envious person. Um, I, for example, I might be an outs outsider, an outstander. I don't have anything to do with this market at all, but I have some aesthetic prejudice. Okay, I feel well if there are some prices that are low and other prices that are high. And I just don't like it if there's general equilibrium. And I just hate this. And my utility dramatically decreases if general equilibrium comes about. So what do we do with this person from a general equilibrium standpoint? His utility decreases as we move closer to general equilibrium. Right. Again, that, that's a problem. How do we bring him into the picture without engaging in interpersonal comparisons of utility, without adding up uh, and subtracting from one another the utilities of different persons? Impossible. Okay. So here we have the fundamental uh, problem of the Pareto approach. And uh, uh, the reason why this cannot be considered of uh, this, this, uh, this theorem that the uh, market in general equilibrium is welfare maximizing cannot be considered a scientific statement. Now, uh, Pareto himself, in the mathematical appendix to uh, uh, his, uh, his textbook, Manual of Political Economy, uh, pointed out that his theorem holds um, under a given definition of appropriation rights. Okay, so he doesn't put this in the main text. He says it, he points this out in the mathematical appendix, okay, where you wouldn't expect it at all. Right? So he said, well, by the way, so my theorem holds under, if we assume given system of appropriation. Okay, now uh, here then we get already uh, to the, uh, we are halfway already at the solution that Murray Rothbard has developed in 1956. in an article with the title Toward a Reconstruction of Welfare and Utility Economics. It's a piece that is widely quoted in the Austrian literature today, even as it pertains to welfare economics. And here Rothbard argued that the free market is inherently welfare maximizing. Okay, by the very fact that in the free market we have uh, social interaction action premised on the respect of property rights, uh, Every interaction, whether it's a gift or, or an exchange, automatically improves the, the position of both people interacting with one another. Okay? Uh, no, so, so Rothbard then, more consciously than, than Pareto, acknowledged also the importance of, of uh, appropriation, uh, the appropriation mechanism here. And he said, well, as soon as we have violations of property right, we can make no longer uh, this assertion that uh, both parties are better off. So therefore, ipso facto, uh, all other systems, apart from the free market, interventionism, socialism, and so on, must be less welfare maximizing. Right? Okay, so what is the problem with this argument? The problem with this argument is uh, it's fine as far as it goes, right? but it is premised on the notion that uh, we count in our uh, analysis only those uh, value judgments or only those utilities that are expressed through the use of property rights and through the respect of property rights. Right? That is, if somebody only, what you do with your own property, and that you, what you demonstrate, the preferences that you demonstrate through the use of your own property, only those preferences count, okay? So the, the position of the envious bystander is excluded by definition. We just, we say, oh, that doesn't count. We keep this crazy guy aside. Only what you do with your property, only this counts. It's demonstrating utility. Now, th that's fine as a, as a definitional approach, but of course you need to justify this. Right? I mean, that's, uh, that seems to be rather arbitrary as long as you give no scientific reason why you should only consider those actions and, and not also the feelings of envious persons and so on. And here then, we come to, uh, to Professor Hoppe's work, which is, uh, in my opinion, the only uh, 
approach so far, uh, in which uh, we uh, have uh, uh, the successful attempt to work around precisely this problem. For what Hopper does is to uh, try to, to justify private property rights based on a purely uh, factual analysis. Uh, so Hopper's approach has been called argumentation ethics. My uh, opinion, that's, that's not a very uh, appropriate name, but I will just describe what it is all about, what the argument is all about, and then you can judge for yourself how we should best describe this. So what Hopper says is um, uh, uh, property rights or pol political discussions uh, political justification of political measures invariably take place in the context of, of a debate, so in the exchange of an argument. Okay. Now, uh, an argument uh, itself is uh, premised uh, on the, so we need to analyze more, more carefully what an argument is all about. What we do in an argument is to make an appeal to our discussion partner uh, to behave differently uh, or to think differently at least, then he would have behaved or thought without our argument. But in so doing, we acknowledge implicitly from the very outset that he has legitimate control over, well, at least his body, his brain, and so on. Otherwise, the argument wouldn't make sense at all. Right? And of course, we also claim, we assume implicitly as well that we are the legitimate owners, exclusive legitimate owners of our vocal cords and of our body, of all uh, elements that we use to make this argument. And if we needed the per permission of, of some other person in order to use our own voice and so on, well, we couldn't make an argument. So invariably, what we presuppose in as far as the political discussion takes place at all, and that is something that is assumed by all sides taking part in a political argument, is that there are absolute property rights pertaining at least to one's body, uh, valid at least for the discussion. Now this is the starting point then from then if we grant then that um, we have to assume uh, property rights in order for a discussion to be possible at all, it also follows that uh, uh, any uh, justification of violations of the property that one has one itself is inherently contradictory. You cannot argue this through. If I say, well, you are not the owner of your body because so-and-so, in making this argument, I, I contradict myself because I implicitly assume that uh, you are you are in factual uh, co control of your, of your body and should exercise this control of your body. Uh, so I, I, I contradict myself. Right? Since only then the uh, justification of uh, absolute property rights in one's own body can be justified um, and violations of this, uh, uh, this property right cannot be justified, we have a starting point from which on we can explain the appro uh, justify and uh, the, the appropriation of other objects uh, in one's body through one's labor, so it's the usual uh, John Locke's uh, homesteading argument. And we can also uh, explain why all justifications of uh, infringements of property rights in material objects are uh, contradictory uh, in turn. Okay. So then what we have here in, in, in Hopper's theory, in my opinion, is a praxeology, praxeology of justification processes. It's a purely fact-based analysis of what the processes are that are taking place in in public uh, policy debates, right? and uh, the conclusion is that only justifications of private that assume the validity of private property can be can be valid, whereas all justifications of violations of private property right run into um, a priori contra contradictions. Right? Right? Any argument that contests the validity of private property rights per se, so not a particular right. You can contest the property right that a robber has in something that he stole, okay, but we cannot contest the validity of private property per se without running into a contradiction. Right? So again, we don't have here an odd proposition, right? therefore argumentation ethics is not quite correct. Right? Hopper doesn't say, well, we ought to respect private property rights, but he tells us we cannot justify uh, 
violations of private property rights without self-contradiction. And on the other hand, we can only justify uh, private property rights without contradiction. So in conclusion then, and to wrap this up and get back in, in time, and we have uh, uh, science that, that is value free, and um, uh, scientific analysis can help us in two ways to, um, to settle public policy uh, debates, to settle the question what is better and what is worth, worse. One is Mises' approach in which we take uh, the, the point of view of our discussion partner and examine whether the means that he proposes to for the attainment of a certain end is in fact a suitable means, is objectively suited to attain this end. That's one, one approach. And the other one is that we uh, take the uh, point of view of the praxeology of justification processes and examine whether a proposed policy can be argued through without self-contradiction or not. That is as far as we can go, as far as I can see. And I'll give you two minutes to raise any questions about this. Yeah. Uh, at least under the same headline as your lecture, it's a work of uh, James Buchanan. Mm -hmm. uh, just briefly, if you could give an assessment or judgment of his work. So uh, James uh, Buchanan, alone among uh, neoclassical economists, has realized that um, uh, we cannot um, uh, uh, decide uh, policy questions in terms of utility. So we cannot do this based on this. And we cannot decide the performance of an economic system without the, the rules, without uh, judging implicitly the rules of transformation of an economic system. So that's the message that he has stressed in great detail. But of course, um, he has not gone all the way because uh, it would have uh, le uh, led him to conclusions very different from his own. Right? One of uh, the great projects of James Buchanan was to justify the minimal state. Uh, right? There's this book, The Limits of Anarchy, uh, 1975, uh, in which he has tried to give a justification of, of the minimal state, uh, which brings him, now uh, irrespective of the merits of his uh, justification, it brings him in, in the position that he, um, that he has to uh, uh, accept the, uh, the legitimacy of at least two completely contradictory methods of appropriation. Right? On the one hand, appropriation through consent, mutual consent, and on the, one, on the other hand, appropriation, at least in some cases, when the government is, is involved, namely, uh, without consent of the previous owner. Uh, yeah, so there's a contradiction here. Right, so, uh, yeah, Buchanan is much more sensitive to this issue than any, any other mainstream economist. Yeah. Another question? Okay, thank you.